Good evening, everybody. So, how was the first day of DefCon with you guys? You enjoyed it? Yeah. Liked it? Yeah. Uh, everyone is pretty much very tired, so <laughs> that's DefCon. <laughs> so, guys, uh, we have last talk of the day uh, before we have uh, contest briefing, right? So, we have Mike and Ron, uh, and they will be presenting uh, cryptocurrency security standard (CCSS). So, here we have Mike and Ron. Thanks, Ajit. Um, yeah, you know what they say, save the best for last, right? Um, uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, staying a little bit later for, uh, uh, for this talk. Uh, I promise it will not be very technical. We're not going to tax your brains. It'll be, uh, it's just an overview of what the CCSS is so that you're able to understand the goals of it. And uh, you can research it on your own time if, if you want to uh, learn more. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I'm Ron Stoner. I'm a security engineer at Shapeshift, hoping to keep everybody's uh, accounts safe while you do your crypto. Um, I'm also the curator of the CCSSA exam. So we're going to talk about the CCSS today. Uh, we have some exciting things also as a result of that. Uh, I run my own consulting firm, and you can find me on Twitter at Forward Secrecy. And uh, I'm Michael Perklin. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer at Shapeshift. I work with Ron. Um, also, I'm the president of C4, which is the nonprofit organization that uh, spent all the time with a variety of companies to pull all the, uh, the data together to create the CCSS and to publish it in an open way so that all of you are able to use it without uh, any restrictions for your own work. Um, I also run a contest here at DEF CON called CoinDroids, which is the world's first blockchain battle game uh, and it's uh, been running here at DEFCON for five years now um, and it's pretty interesting. So a uh, quick note about C4. Uh, C4 is a nonprofit organization that uh, deals with me measurements and standards. Our first project was the CBP, Certified Bitcoin Professional. Uh, which is for, uh, for people, and our second project was the CCSS, which I'll be talking about today, which is for systems. Um, it, uh, it's been running now for uh, six years, and uh, we've got some, some pretty good board members, uh, including uh, Vitalik Buterin, uh, Andres Antonopoulos, Pamela Morgan, Josh, and Joshua McDougall. Um, the CBP, uh, which is what I mentioned, is the, the, the world's first uh, certification related to Bitcoin or blockchains. Um, it, it's a, basically how this was formed was, well, we recognized that there was a need in the industry for everybody who didn't know what Bitcoin was to be able to identify somebody who did know Bitcoin. Um, when, when we started C4, uh, we realized that uh, while I know what, what Bitcoin is, and if I'm interviewing somebody, uh, I can ask them pointed questions, and I can tell if they actually understand Bitcoin or if they're just repeating you know, a news headline and they don't quite understand what a Bitcoin is. Um, uh, but I'm already uh, knowledgeable about Bitcoin, so it's easy for me to identify knowledge in others. But there are so many hiring managers, presidents, CEOs who know that they need someone who understands Bitcoin uh, on their team, but they don't know the first question to ask them in, a, uh, in the interview. Uh, this problem has been solved many times before in a variety of industries. Uh, like uh, in accounting, they have the Certified Professional uh, Accountant designation, the CPA. Um, uh, so uh, these types of certifications have meaning for HR uh, just to make sure that they're interviewing the right candidates. Uh, and we realized that there was no, no such animal for Bitcoin, so we decided to make it. Yeah. Can you talk the talk and can you walk the walk? Mm -hmm. uh, while the CBP w uh, was the, the first project we did, which is related to people, um, measuring uh, a person's knowledge to make sure that they meet the bar, uh, the minimum bar for understanding how to use Bitcoin safely, um, uh, the CCSS is much different. Um, the CCSS is, uh, is for information systems, uh, for a vault that you've created uh, for, your, for your enterprise or uh, for any other system that ends up holding Bitcoin. Yeah, so when we're talking about the CCSS, uh, we're talking about security standard. So we've seen a bunch of different security standards throughout industries over time. And in crypto, um, we have CCSS. It's providing clear security guidance. It's providing a framework. It's providing security controls that information systems can adapt into their, uh, into their system. And it's free for everybody to use. 
Why do we need it? We want to we want to um, instill confidence in uh, in customers and people using these systems. There's a lot of fly by night operations in crypto. You guys have seen the news articles. You've seen funds go missing. Everybody's kind of doing it their own different way, and there's not really a good standardization for this. So we can see that you know with these different companies, Mt. Gox, Coinbase. Uh, a lot of these companies were wrapped up with hacks and loss of funds, unfortunately, because they weren't following proper uh, security standard and procedures. Or they weren't hacked, uh, and, or they weren't hacked uh, because they were following uh, the pro proper uh, procedures. There was uh, everybody was sort of doing it their own way. Yeah. As we said before, when you're looking at things like uh, doing business with people that are processing credit card companies, you look for PCI. When you're talking about your medical data, you want to see that HIPAA on it, right? And we know that that may not be the be all end all, but they're protecting your data. They're taking the steps. They're doing things correct within a standard to make sure that your information and your stuff is safe. Uh, we have things like ISO 27 or 27001. But when it comes to currency, what do we have? Cryptocurrency. Um, so every industry has a standard and uh, we're trying to fulfill that need. So now that you have an idea of what the CCSS is, let me reinforce what the CCSS is not. The CCSS is not a replacement for ISO 27001 or for uh, traditional cybersecurity. Uh, you still have to worry about you know, malware, you have to worry about uh, insider threats, you have to worry about all that stuff. Um, the CCSS focuses razor sharp on the, on the keys themselves. How are the keys generated? How are they used? How are they stored? Uh, and how are, how are they decommissioned uh, after use? Right. Additionally, who's accessing them? What are they doing with them? Things like that. So when we get into uh, CCSS, we know security isn't just tech. Um, security is all encompassing, right? It, it, it's a whole bunch of different domains. It's a whole bunch of different systems within itself. If all you're doing is installing host intrusion detection and calling it a day, you're not doing it correctly, right? So when we get into information systems, we're talking about all these different domains with hardware, with software, with all of your procedures, with your policies. Um, are those things being cut up to date? Are they being tested? Who has awareness of those policies? Or if X employee leaves an information system, uh, is that knowledge gone? And all five of these things, um, they, are, they work together like a chain. And you're only as strong as your weakest link. You could have the best hardware uh, ever. You could have the, uh, the most advanced software. You know, you're totally patched with everything. But if you're standard procedure is to write down a password and put it on, as a sticky note on your monitor, it doesn't matter how much tech you have or what encryption algorithms you're using, you're, you're going to fuck it up. Um, so the CCSS uh, looks at an entire information system as a whole, which is all five of these areas uh, all combined. Does anybody know where the weak chain is in this picture? <laughs> yeah. Nice, nice joke. Good eye, yeah. So when we get into the CCSS, we, we get into 10 overall aspects that we're talking about here. And as Michael said, it's very heavy on keys with usage, storage, uh, how those keys are handed off, who has access to them. But then we get into other things that people may not be thinking about, like your data sanitization policy. So DSP is a big one where all the corporations say, you know, we've got these policies and we're doing all this stuff. But when you dumpster dive them, you find out that may not be the actual case. Yeah, and there are uh, 33 separate controls that fit into these 10 different aspects. Uh, we're going to give an overview of each of these 10 aspects uh, and, and uh, what is uh, covered uh, uh, in them. We're not going to get into too much detail uh, because this is a, uh, a fairly high level uh, talk. Uh, if you do have any questions uh, specifically about some of these, uh, there's definitely going to be some time at the end. And uh, of course, all this is published free uh, open source online. The CCSS has three different levels, uh, and they are additive. Um, there's uh, level one, level two, and level three, whereas level three would be the highest, level one is, uh, is the lowest. Um, but uh, where level one is the lowest, that doesn't mean that that is uh, poor security. It's actually great security. Um, level two is even better security, and level three is, is paranoid. Um, uh, to my knowledge, no system out there uh, meets level three uh, uh, security, but that's fine. They don't necessarily have to. Uh, I've said this many times before, and, uh, and I'll say it again. Uh, any system that is certified level two, I believe, uh, would, uh, would not be able to have the funds exfiltrated. Now, I'm not saying that they won't, won't be able to get hacked. 
they could still definitely get hacked. But um, a successful hack would not be able to pull any of the funds out of a system if it is level two compliant. Um, we'll get into a, a little bit of the, uh, the details of uh, level one, two, and three. But uh, as, a, uh, as a high level, the next slide shows um, uh, sort of the, the, the chain model. If you were to take a look at all 10 of these areas, um, now across the top you can see uh, level one, two, or three. Uh, if, if this is a an example um, checklist for Acme Exchange Company, now if Acme Exchange Company, the way that they uh, generate their seeds are compliant with level one, they don't do it compliant with level two or level three, but they are still secure with level one. But the way that they create their wallets actually does reach level three, and you can see uh, some of the the differences here. This system would be graded as level one because that is the one commonality. Um, all of these boxes would have to be in, in level two in order for the system to be compliant with level two and similar for level three. So uh, uh, it, it's, it's important to look at the system as a whole uh, to understand how all of these things are individually graded in order to uh, apply a grade to the overall system. And that overall grade is the lowest common denominator uh, out of everything. And as Michael said, even with level one, some people think level one's bad, but if I was looking to do business or, or move my funds to an information system uh, that was level one certified, I know that they're checking off all those boxes or, or level one compliant. I know they're checking off those boxes. They've done proper procedures with their keys. Uh, I can more trust that information system than somebody that's not compliant with any of these controls. And actually, before we, we jump in uh, to each of these in a little bit more detail, uh, one thing I want to say is, is how the CCSS was compiled. Uh, so in, in 2012 and 2013, uh, uh, C4 contacted as many exchanges as we could to understand more details of any of the hacks that occurred. And we gathered a whole bunch of data from security professionals all over the world. And then we started organizing it. Why was this exchange hacked here? Why was that exchange hacked here? Why is this exchange not hacked? And we identified the commonalities, which allowed us to group them together into these 10 aspects. So it was through uh, a lot of data analysis that the volunteers at C4 uh, and the companies that submitted data, we all worked together to uh, pull them together like this. Um, and with no further ado, let's jump into each of these 10 aspects in a little bit more detail. So the first one we're going to tackle is key seed generation, and probably one of the most important parts of a cryptocurrency information system. Um, you can have everything secure, but if the person that generated your keys has a copy of that private key or seed at home, you're screwed at that point. So when we get into key seed generation, we're talking about things like, um, was the key and seed issued by another actor? Um, was it created with a compliant DRBG, deterministic random bit generator? So when you get into the very fine technical details of randomness and pseudo randomness, that can have some far reaching effects on your business, right? And your information system, depending on, on how those keys were rolled and what they were rolled with. We also talk about things like wallet creation. Um, what was being used when that wallet was created? Were unique addresses being used for the uh, ultra paranoid level three side of security? Um, as you can see, level one doesn't have any controls here listed for, uh, for wallet creation, but level two and three does. So if you were looking at a compliant level one system, you would know that they may not or may have done some things with this control, um, but depending on how they've done it, they, they can certify different, different levels, one, two, or three based off of how those wallets were created. And for those of you who are here at the in the previous talk, uh, where Mila went through the the various algorithms that make up uh, Bitcoin, um, uh, that's denoted here, uh, where uh, uh, Bitcoin is quantum safe as long as you are always using a brand new address. Uh, now you can still use use Bitcoin uh, while while reusing an address uh, and and uh, keeping. To, you know, you, pardon me. Um, uh, while you can still use Bitcoin safely while reusing an address, the ultra paranoid people will always make sure they're always using a new address just uh, to make sure that they're quantum safe. There is no known attack today that uh, can reverse a, a uh, private key uh, fr from the public key. However, uh, if you want to be paranoid, you should always be using unique addresses. And that's why that's a level um, three control. 
when we're talking about keys, we're also talking about the ge geographic distribution of the keys. Um, where do those keys live? Is it in single location, multiple locations? When we get into this, we're talking about things and we're looking at business continuity and disaster recovery, or uh, if a key's lost or uh, access to a wallet is lost, is it in another location that you can get access to and either get access to those funds or do what you need to do in those, in those times? So we've got generated keys and we're generating them securely, but how are we storing them? So we've got different controls here for things like backup keys. Um, one that people don't really think about is, are you storing your keys encrypted? So everybody might have their backup of their key in their safe or in their desk drawer, but when somebody gets access to it, do they have another step that they have to take to get access to that key material? Or do they just then have raw keys that they can take and start using at that point? We also look for things like, does the backup key have a tamper evident seal? Um, however you wanna achieve that, that's fine, as long as there's some evidence to say, this key's been accessed or somebody else has had access to this from the last time that I've had that. Um, and as you can see, when we get to one to three, those controls get a little bit more paranoid with backing them up with access controls, um, even encrypting backup keys, which people don't think about. They always think about uh, pr encrypting the primary key after they see the information on the previous slide, but they never think about their backups uh, or uh, you know different copies of those keys they have in other locations. Continuing on the life cycle of a key, we went through how the key was created and then how the key was stored. Let's jump into how the key is used. Uh, so there are a variety of controls in this section, uh, including um, uh, uh, how many factors are required to access the key. Uh, can anybody just get it or do I need to have um, a username and a password and maybe a, a 2FA code in order to use, use the key? Um, are the keys used in a trusted environment or are you uh, uh, signing something in, in a Starbucks off of uh, an unsecure Wi-Fi? Um, who gets to use those keys and what checks do you do on them? Whoever is going to be interacting with your keys has an opportunity to, to make a copy of the key and, and use it in an unauthorized way. So before you give them access to your key, what checks are you doing to make sure that uh, you want them to have access to your keys. Uh, and are they even the, the right person? Um, maybe they started at your company with a fake name or, or something like that. So, uh, I mean, these are small checks, but they're definitely important before you give access uh, to these people. Uh, a, a few more for key usage. Um, uh, background checks. Uh, do they have a history of, uh, of, of, of credit risk? Um, while their personal finances have nothing to do with your business. Um, if, they, uh, if they're constantly in debt and they're constantly having a difficulty um, making their own ends meet, they're more likely to find money another way, um, whereas uh, uh, the opposite is true if, uh, if they're not. Um, now, when the key is used to sign something, what kind of uh, double checks are you doing to make sure you're sending to the, to the right destination address? And are you sending the, the right amount? <coughs> Um, uh, if it's a multi-sig system, uh, are those multiple, multiple keys brought together on a single device or are the multiple keys used independently on separate devices? There have been a number of hacks uh, of a multi-sig system where uh, a, a Trojan made its way onto the, the, the final signing system, the, the system where multiple separate keys for multiple separate key holders are brought together. Um, that's not the safest way to do it. Uh, making sure that each key is kept separate uh, is important. Uh, and uh, as part of every digital signature, uh, I believe uh, Mila also talked about this in, in her last talk, uh, as part of every single digital signature, there is a random number that is used. How is that random number derived? Uh, uh, there have been cases where the same number has been used uh, for multiple signatures, which can allow someone to uh, re recompute the original private key. And staying with keys, we're going to get into how they're granted and revoked because this is an important part of the process itself. So we have controls in place for, um, is there actual grant and revocation procedures created? Um, who's knowledgeable on the staff with those procedures? Or does it just sit in a, uh, a document repository somewhere that, you know, they've checked off the box saying this policy has been created, but nobody ever looks at it, nobody ever uses it, and nobody knows how to enact it when the time comes. 
Um, we also look for things like authenticated requests over authenticated communication channels. Um, so this gets interesting because we get into the concept of, uh, of strong authentication and making sure that you know who you're speaking with, verifying them over different ways, not just getting a Slack message or an SMS message and trusting that this person has said, yes, sign this transaction and send 10,000 Bitcoin to this address, right? We're, we're going to verify that before we do that. Um, and then looking for things like audit trails with employee sign offs for all of these actions. So not only are the steps being taken and are they being followed, but are we taking down audit trails so that if there is an issue, we can go back and find out where there was a problem or, or where something went wrong. This is one of my favorite ones as a security engineer, the key compromise protocol, KCP. So the shit hits the fan and we need to do something. Um, we want to see that the, a, key or a key compromise protocol exists, number one. Have people thought about this? Have they built a system to take care of this or a policy or procedure? Um, do they have staff that are uh, knowledgeable with key compromise uh, policies? Uh, are they comfortable running that type, of, that type of procedure if they need to go in and revoke keys that control uh, X amount of dollars or X amount of funds? And for those who don't know uh, what we mean by a, a key compromise uh, protocol, uh, it's basically a script of what you would do the moment you believe maybe a key might be compromised. By spending the time to think about all this beforehand, uh, when you're in a rush situation, you don't, you don't need to worry about making mistakes because you just follow the script. Step one, step two, step three, and now all the, uh, all the keys are properly replaced. Uh, Moving on, there, there are only a few more uh, aspects and then we'll open up to questions. Uh, security audits. The CCSS defines a couple of requirements for security audits, namely that they are done regularly. Um, uh, it's not really much more to, to say about this one. Um, there are... Oh, do, oh no, I was going to add on to that. But. Um, one thing that we haven't really talked about that's important to see on this slide is the uncertified status. Um, so you can see here in red, no proof of security for security audits. Um, I, I think we all know of places that claim they're secure, but when it comes down to it and you want to see the audit information, there's nothing there, right? They've never done a pen test. They've never done vulnerability scans or code review. Um, with that uncertified status, you could be level three across the board on everything else. And if you're uncertified on one of these controls, you're not going to be compliant with the CCSS because as Michael said, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And in this example, this would be the weakest link. Um, approaching the end now, um, the, the data sanitization policy. Keys have to be stored somewhere when, when they are uh, in use, likely on a hard drive of some kind of, uh, of a server, or um, maybe they're on, uh, on a cold storage device, uh, some laptop that is being air-gapped. Um, the, 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 having a data sanitization policy uh, that details how you're going to scrub the data from those devices when those devices reach end of life is mandatory. Otherwise, anybody who finds your old laptop hard drive in a, in a dumpster somewhere, uh, they could, in theory, get your keys back. Yeah, this man loves dumpster diving. Yes, I do. Um, and it's also important to have an audit trail of uh, what has been uh, sanitized and when, although that is more of a, a paranoid level uh, control. Um, next is proof of reserve. Uh, there are a variety of ways that companies uh, implement proof of reserves, uh, oftentimes just publishing a report saying, hey, uh, here are all the, here's all the crypto we have. Uh, the, the controls uh, mostly mandate that there is some way to prove uh, control. However, uh, the, the best way is when the blockchain, the blockchain itself uh, can prove it for you. By publishing all the addresses that your system uses to the users of your system, now your users are able to independently validate that those coins really are there at those addresses. Instead of trusting uh, uh, the entity that just says, yes, we have a thousand Bitcoin here. Oh, but no, we're not going to give you the specific addresses of where all those are, are held. Uh, it removes all trust. And if we look at level three, the question may come up of um, what happens with information systems that don't hold funds anymore? Uh, Non-custodial exchanges, which I happen to be a big fan of. Um, in those instances, uh, they would comply with level three because there's no funds stored. There's no need to actually list a proof of reserve because they're not holding anything on behalf of, uh, behalf of customers or systems at that point. 
And then we get into audit logging. So we've talked about keys, we've talked about key holders, we've talked about verifying identities and making sure people can be trusted and are following the pop proper policies and procedures. Uh, but we need to make sure that, again, audit logs exist for all these actions in the system. Um, level one, we're logging some actions. Level two, we're logging everything for user and admin controls. Uh, and the same for level three. So as you can see, some level two controls are good enough to meet level three requirements. Um, outside of a full audit trail existing for user and admin uh, actions, I don't know what else you could, could add in there for audit logging to, uh, to make it more secure. And then we also want to see backups of our audit logs. So it's great if you're running your server and everything's uh, fine, but then somebody goes in and wipes it or you have a disaster event. Uh, are you keeping your logs off site? Uh, do you have BCDR uh, policies and procedures in place, business continuity uh, for, for audit logging information? So that is the CCSS in a nutshell. There are 36 individual controls that are spread across 10 different aspects or 10 different categories. Um, and all of them need to be uh, uh, graded individually, and the lowest common denominator will be the overall rank of that uh, information system. Uh, as far as using the CCSS, uh, the standard is published online uh, for free for anybody to use um, without uh, need for royalties, and the source for the standard is uh, published on GitHub. Uh, if you're uh, interested in, in reading uh, about it, I encourage you to visit cryptoconsortium.org. And if you are passionate about security, like Ron and I are, uh, we encourage you to, to, to get involved. Um, we have um, a handy uh, empty matrix, uh, just like that, uh, that ACME checklist. Uh, you can grab that, uh, that checklist uh, off of the, the C4 website. And I encourage you to try to assess yourself. Uh, think critically about each of the, the different controls and, and see where your system uh, falls. What's great about measuring your, your system like this is um, once it's done, you'll see exactly where uh, you have an opportunity to improve the security of your system. Um, we are always looking for people to, uh, uh, to submit feedback uh, on the standard, either um, uh, posting comments on GitHub or uh, posting issues or posting uh, pull requests. If you feel that you could improve it, we'd love to hear from you. Um, uh, C4 is a volunteer-run organization, and if you want to volunteer your time and your security knowledge, we'd be happy to, uh, uh, to take it. As well as becoming a part of an ever-growing uh, compliance standard in cryptocurrency. Last thing I'll, I'll um, uh, talk about is the upcoming blockchain training conference. Now, uh, the coupon code you see on, on screen will will uh, save you 10% off the ticket price. And if you visit the CoinDroids booth in the contest area, you can get another coupon code for another 10% off, uh, giving you a combined 20% off of the, of the ticket price. At the Blockchain Training Conference, this is the first time C4 is going to be having a full day workshop on the CCSS to train you or, or anybody that, that you'd like to, uh, to send on your behalf on how to use the CCSS in real world scenarios. Uh, it's taught by, by Ron right here, um, who also wrote the CCSSA uh, exam. Uh, the goal of this bootcamp is to prepare the next generation of auditors uh, on using these standards to assess a system and to guide their clients on improving uh, their security. Uh, with that, let's open it up to questions. Uh, I've got some some swag for some uh, some good good questions if uh, if you have them. You sir had your your first. Uh, yes. How do question. we detect a key might be compromised? What do you have a policy or procedure? The question was, how do you detect that a key has become compromised, uh, or might be compromised? Uh, that that's a great question, and there unfortunately is no silver bullet, uh, like everything in security, there is no silver bullet that, uh, that can solve that. Um, there are a variety of ways that you, you, you could um, uh, try to detect things, such as um, uh, canary uh, payments, or, or sorry, I guess uh, canary addresses, uh, putting small amounts of funds on certain keys that are available on servers and watching for when those funds move. Uh, during your normal course of business, those funds should never move. But the moment that they have moved, it could indicate compromise of that system. Um, uh, also, um, uh, the key compromise uh, uh, pr protocol that we talked about doesn't only cover known compromise, it also covers suspected compromise. If one of the key holders suddenly becomes unavailable for, for 24 hours and all attempts of contacting them have failed, their family doesn't know where they are either, um, it's possible that they could have been kidnapped. Uh, it's possible that, uh, God forbid, they 
may no longer be around. Um, in, in any of, the, of these cases, if you suspect that either the key or the key holder may be compromised, the, the key compromise protocol should be enacted as if they were compromised uh, either way. Uh, it's always better to um, to proactively uh, move all the funds to new keys when you think there might be a problem than to uh, hope uh, and it, it doesn't work out. So basically, I just want to know you don't have a policy or standard on the CCSS, right? Uh, the, the, the question was, uh, does the CCSS have a standard for uh, detection? Um, no, but because, the, because every information system is different, uh, the way that you would detect a actual compromise or a possible compromise would be different for every standard. Uh, if you have a, a good way of... Uh, of writing an aspect that could cover that for a variety of different information systems, I'd, I'd love to add something like that to the CCSS. Uh, if, if you want to um, visit GitHub and submit that, do you want to take the next question, Ron? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so the question was when you're looking at reviewing things like the random number generator, the DRBG, the deterministic random bit generator, um, <clears throat> how far do you go when you're looking at that control? Are you looking at things like source code? And I think it <clears throat> really depends on the implementation. So um, there's a variety of ways to do entropy in RNG where people could be rolling dice and cards and inputting that into a script and spitting out some keys based off of calculations. They could be using a hardware device that's measuring the difference in electronic current. Um, so it really depends on the implementation. I think when you, you get into that aspect, you do look at how did you roll them? What did you use? Did you use your own code? Did you use something you pulled off GitHub? Did you use a device? Um, and at that point, it's a lot easier to drill down and determine where does this fit level one, level two, level three, or um, uncertified. Yeah, and to add to Ron's uh, answer, um, the CCSS uh, requires DRBGs to be compliant with a variety of uh, well-known and globally, globally accepted standards, specifically NIST uh, 800A. 60A, I think. Oh, it's written on here somewhere. Yeah. Um, if the... Yeah, um, he'll pop it up. But uh, if, if the DRBG is compliant with the NIST, there it is, SP890A, um, uh, then uh, it, it would be a, a compliant DRBG. Uh, if you're using, let's say, Electrum to uh, generate your keys, um, uh, you, the, the, the source code of Electrum should be looked at to make sure that it's not using its own method of, uh, of random generation, and it is calling a well-known uh, PRNG. And then it should also look at how that PRNG is being seeded. Once we know that Electrum is using a well-known PRNG that is compliant, then uh, uh, then we know that that one uh, would be certified. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Perfect. But uh, the dual ECDRBG, which was again this compliant, yeah. was having backdoor history question. I'm sorry, could you ask that question again? So EC, dual ECDRBG, which was again a this compliant thing, uh, but it was backdoor. So GDP was using it. Uh, so not Uh, the, the, the comment was that uh, even NIST compliant DRBGs uh, have been uh, known to be compromised. And you know what? Security is always evolving. Uh, as long as we're doing, the, uh, doing our best to be uh, up to date with, with the, the current best practices, then we know that we're doing our best. But we can't uh, protect against uh, unknowns that haven't even been uh, invented yet. Uh, let's go with uh, Red Shirt. How useful is the CCSS to non-custodial wallets was the question. Uh, it's a great question. Um, so a non-custodial system, let's say uh, a, a DEX, a, a, a decentralized exchange, uh, the exchange itself doesn't store uh, funds on their own. Uh, DEXs match make uh, someone who is selling one token and somebody who is selling another token. So uh, the DEX itself uh, actually can't be certified by the CCSS because that system doesn't actually store funds. Each user, each participant of the system uh, would be required to safeguard their own keys for, for their own funds on that side. Does that answer your question? Perfect. Miss in the back. So 
So the question was, uh, and that was a long one, uh, but please correct me if I get the question um, uh, incorrect, but uh, how would risk managers use the CCSS to, actually, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Gotcha. So how does the CCSS map to other standards or other um, uh, systems of control? Um, uh, my answer would, would be, again, that it is uh, a, a separate uh, set. Most of the existing uh, standards that are out there uh, relate to uh, one aspect or another. For example, the PCI uh, compliance relates to storing of credit card information but only credit card information. Uh, HIPAA relates to storing of healthcare information. The CCSS is razor focused only on the storing of private keys. Now, uh, because p both PCI and HIPAA have been around for so long, uh, it, it's common knowledge for, for board members to say, oh, are you HIPAA compliant? Yes, are you uh, uh, PCI compliant? Uh, it's our hope that through the development of the standard and the regular uh, curation of the standard, that uh, being CCSS compliant tomorrow will be as, as common knowledge as being PCI stand, uh, compliant is today. And to just add on to that, um, I think for anybody that's trying to make a play to a board or anything like that, all you have to do is link them and show them all the different hacks and loss of funds and cryptocurrency information systems that have happened even within the past few months, right? Um, they, they like dollar figures and showing them dollar figures and making it real world, I, I think always brings it full circle. And one, one other thing I'll, uh, I'll add to that is um, the... Uh, a variety of exchanges already list uh, their uh, voluntary compliance with the CCSS standard if you dig into their frequently asked questions. Um, so a lot of exchanges are already using this and there have been a, a number of um, uh, uh, so a number of regulations from a few different uh, jurisdictions that have already referenced the CCSS in, in the laws. Um, most notably in, um, in Bermuda, uh, they, they recently uh, passed um, a, I don't know if it's, a, if, an, if it's an act or, uh, I apologize, I'm not a lawyer, um, but uh, it was referenced in their, um, uh, in their laws that any, any company that is going to be uh, operating in the cryptocurrency space should be compliant with at least CCSS level one. Also in Wyoming, uh, right here in the United States, uh, the CCSS was referenced in the recent blockchain laws there as well. So uh, the standard is already starting to be adopted by lawmakers uh, worldwide. And um, uh, uh, anything that we can do to help these people who don't understand t tech to at least get a nice little checkbox, uh, I, I think is a win for all of us. Mr. in the black shirt. So uh, a summary of the question, please cor uh, correct me if I get it uh, wrong, is um, how do you actually ensure that people are using the standard, the, the thorough standard, and they're not just, um, uh, I guess, uh, uh, making a bunch of check marks without uh, doing it? And you know what? I don't know of any way that you can. Um, uh, if, if an auditor goes in and just issues a report and they sign their name on it and it says, hey, you're, everything's perfect, um, if, if they want to uh, put their reputation on the line to make a lie, there's nothing that I don't think anybody can do uh, to stop that. Um, uh, maybe having two independent auditors uh, perform the same checks, and if you see any inconsistencies between the two, that might um, uh, make some progress in doing that. But even still, uh, just, like just as easily as one person could, could lie on a report, two people could, could lie on a report. Um, if you can think of any way uh, to enforce, um, I guess, uh, the integrity of, uh, of these people's reputation, I'm all ears. I, I think, too, it, it comes down to um, 
if a business says they're HIPAA compliant, right? And they've checked off all those boxes and then they have a breach and your medical data gets out there, everyone's going to look at that and say, well, you are you weren't actually HIPAA compliant, right? You weren't following those those standards and procedures. You you fleece the auditor, you just check the box off to check the box off. And I think at that point, that's on the business, right? From a lit- litigation standpoint and everything and a reputation standpoint. Um, so we would hope that businesses wouldn't do that, but having the auditors in the pipeline definitely helps with the process to validate some of those controls and say, well, no, your KCP is two lines on a Word document. It's not an actual procedure that anybody can follow, you know, step A to Z. So. Any other questions? Gray shirt. Have third party audits been completed? Yes. Um, I, I'm aware of at least three consulting firms that have used the CCSS when uh, grading the security of their of their clients work. Uh, I only know of this because um, uh, C4 um, was was reached out to uh, by these uh, these firms, uh, just double checking um, some minutia in uh, in the standard to make sure that they were uh, they were using it correctly. Um, and now that uh, the now that C4 is planning on launching the auditor certification uh, uh, later this year, um, these auditors who are already doing uh, doing, doing this this type of work to see if if, uh, if a system is compliant, uh, these auditors can become certified and uh, they'll be able to say that not only do I believe this uh, to be compliant, uh, I am bestowing the certification on that uh, on that system. Uh, right now, uh, be- because it, it's a uh, it's an open system. Uh, the best anybody can say is, I believe I'm compliant with it, or I believe he is compliant with it. But no, there are no uh, exchanges, there are no s- systems that are certified compliant. Once we have the auditors that are uh, properly trained, uh, and uh, we know that they understand the, uh, the standard thoroughly, uh, their word will be their bond. Um, yeah. yeah. So, uh, can we go to uh, the other slide where it lists all the checks, pen checks? Sure. Uh, the ACME uh, slide. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit farther. Oh, it's doing the build. Yep, patience. One more, or two more. There we go. Yeah, maybe where it lists all the tenors. Oh, well, the yeah, the ten, the tenor listed here. So out of these, right? So if you are technical, so you can run some tools and you can uh, audit them. Okay, some are procedural where you have to like where you have to by asking for this. So that you have done now what you are doing for this. Yep. Any other questions? Is, is there any plans to expand on the um, intent or the function of it being an audit um, focus to more of a, a qualitative assessment and maybe range of efficacy in each area as far as maturity levels? Any, any plans for expanding it in that way? So the question was, uh, are, are there any plans to expand this from an auditor focused thing to more of a qualitative uh, f- focused uh, standard. Um, it, it's my belief that in order for any auditor to be effective, they have to do a qualitative uh, assessment. Sure, there um, there are some quantitative pieces to it, making sure that this is done, enumerating you know how many keys are in the system. Some of those will be quantitative, but uh, those numbers don't really mean anything unless you put them in context. Just because there is a multi-sig system that is three of five doesn't suddenly mean that it is good. Um, like the the picture of uh, of the chain, it it's everything around the ecosystem of those keys that make it a secure system. Um, uh, auditors need to make sure that they look at all aspects of the information system, not just the, the quantitative part, in order to uh, make an accurate assessment. Question. Ajit. Yeah. So uh, you said uh, all the keys should be backed up, and that backup should be again in So where do those keys be? Because anytime we generate a private key, it has to be password protected. Um, depending on the uh, the yeah, thank you. The um, level that you're going for. So some people may say we can never be level two or level three. Or um, I think let me see. In the instance where yeah, so for level one, you do need to have backup keys, right? So we want to see that for BCDR. Um, we want to protect it from environmental damage, and then we want that primary key to be stored with strong encryption across the board. Now, when you get into backup keys. 
Um, we're starting to get more into the more paranoid levels of security, right? Really, uh, really tight, secure systems where they're, as Michael said, level two, we shouldn't see any, any loss of funds or anything like that. Um, but at that point, you're, you're starting to get to the paranoid level of security. Now, your question was about backup keys of the backup keys. Yes, only for level three. Uh, so um, uh, every system that I've ever worked with, I always recommend that you do not encrypt the backup key uh, because uh, of that exact problem. Where do you store the decryption key for the backups? Um, uh, however, there are, there are some companies that feel more comfortable knowing that even their backups are encrypted. Um, I would advise those uh, those people to make sure that those um, decryption keys are s stored equally secure. But uh, somebody said turtles all the way down, and I definitely think that that applies here, uh, which is one of the reasons why I personally um, uh, don't like systems that encrypt the backup keys. Because if the person who knows where that decryption key is uh, dies or passes away, how do the surviving uh, operators of the system get that? Uh, I, I, I said earlier that I, I believe uh, a system that is level two compliant uh, can never have the funds stolen, even if they are hacked. Uh, and I, I, I stick by that. Yes. Uh, the question is, how do you feel about social key recovery? Do you want to take this one or should I? What do you mean by social? Uh, Yeah, so, so social key recovery um, involves sharding a key into, let's say, three of five, and then you give each of these five pieces to five people that you know and trust. Uh, if something ever happens to you, any three of these five friends or family members can get together to uh, reconstitute the, the key. Um, uh, in my opinion, that's just uh, a backup me me mechanism. Whether you, you etch the key on steel and put it in, in, uh, in a safe, or you shard the key and you uh, uh, divide it uh, amongst um, uh, key custodians, uh, either way, you're, you're backing up the key. Uh, I, I definitely would think that that would be compliant uh, with the CCSS. Yes, sir. Uh, Based on how much you might cost. The question was, um, uh, at what quantity of funds um, would you recommend a certain level of, uh, of compliance with the CCSS? Uh, and my answer would be, I, I can't answer that for you. Uh, every business is different. Does 10 million represent a, uh, a fraction of your daily volume? Or does 10 million represent like, the, the cumulative sum of, uh, of you know, years worth of work? Uh, to your business, 10 million um, could mean something totally different than to somebody else's business. Um, my advice would be, uh, uh, take a look at your use case, take a look at the funds that need to be secured, and use your best judgment on, uh, on how to secure that. Yeah, I, I don't think there's like X number to say at this value, you want to be doing business with a level two company or anything like that. It's all, all based more off of your own personal risk profile and what you're comfortable with. Um, yeah. I, I believe you could, yeah, yeah. If you're doing proper development processes and you're going through this checklist and checking off each of those boxes and, and getting into the controls in depth, three person team could definitely be level one compliant. They just um, so we're for level two. Yeah, that's for level two, and we're getting into things like multi multi signatures and stuff like that. Um, to go back to your original question too, with the ten million, uh, let's say you have X amount, and we're talking about cryptocurrency, right? So we're storing crypto on these information systems or processing crypto. Ten million today could be a hundred million tomorrow. So if you're comfortable with X money on that at level one, you know what's it going to be at level two when we're at the moon? Um, level one requires, uh, or it doesn't have any requirement for multi-sig. Uh, level one is a secure system with, with single signatures. Um, that would apply more to uh, Ethereum style um, uh, uh, systems where it, there's only one key for that uh, uh, contract. Um, uh, multi-sig is uh, level two and above. Um, 
to, so you, you don't need to be level two. Uh, sorry, you don't need to have multi-sig in order to be compliant. You can absolutely be compliant with level, level or with one key. That is all the time we have. Um, if you do have any more questions, uh, maybe we can walk and talk back to uh, the rest of the, the conference area. But thank you very much, um, uh, Coinbase, for host, for sponsoring this uh, Blockchain Village. Thank you very much, uh, Ajit, and uh, all the volunteers that, that work with you for putting this together. Uh, I, I think it's great that we have a blockchain-focused uh, village at DEF CON, and I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.